All right, this diagram of the Borgia Bell Ringer, you up. Uh, it's frozen for those of you present in class. <clears throat> you were uh, supposed to kind of explain the, uh, the implication of each word and then draw a bubble diagram. Right, Ryan? Yeah. And uh, so we're going to go down the rows, and I'm going to ask you what each of these five words, each of these five words are a title of the sacrament that we're, as you now know, are covering, you know, confession. And while most of us refer to it as confession most popularly, the Catholic Church uses all five of these terms to say the sacrament of reconciliation. I'm sure you, that's used more when, in the younger years for whatever reason. Penance, conversion, and forgiveness are not as commonly used, but they're official titles. Each one of these emphasizes something different, and that's what I want to walk through today uh, to intro the sacrament. So that when I use the term, you know, sacrament of reconciliation, sacrament of uh, conversion, you understand what I'm emphasizing with each of those terms. So, Elena, what did you get for uh, confession? What does that word imply or emphasize? Okay, the word sacrament implies a saying or telling of your own sins. Um, really, two parts of that. It's, it's a direct thing said on your part, but it's always of something bad. You know, we don't confess things that are good. I don't confess uh, how well I played the other day or, or how great my GPA is. You don't confess. You confess bad things, right? And, of course, the implication here is you're confessing your sins. So the word sacrament of confession... Oh, yeah. Yeah, everything's pretty good. Thanks, Stacy. That's very sweet. New Year, new resolutions, happy days at Turlings. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the sacrament of confession... I'm going to uh, maybe edit this out of the video. Uh, <laughs> confession implies, uh, yeah, saying of your sins, uh, which is, of course, the hardest part. Um, Jada, reconciliation, what does that word imply? Ooh, nice word. That's one of uh, the, the, those ringer contributions from Jada. Reconciliation, she says, uh, speaks of atonement. Um they're, they're related but different. The atonement uh, is kind of uh, becoming united again, uh, which is what reconciliation is. Grant, what word did you have for reconciliation? What do you branch off of that? To... Okay. Sure. But Cohen, that word in itself, reconciliation, what is that? Restore. That's a great. That's a great synonym. Restore. Uh, reconnect. Um, Reestablish a relationship. Um, another thing about reconciliation: if uh, if you were fighting with your parents for however however long, you decide to come clean and talk it out with your parents, you might say, "Oh yeah, we were reconciled." Uh, that word also. It's whenever it's used, it implies peace. So branch off of that in your diagram. Reconciliation implies there's now a peace that exists between two parties. It's not just like, okay, yeah, you're still on the team, but it's like we are, we've come to grips with what happened, and we are moving on. We are reconciled to each other. Of course, the implication here is between you and God. All right, so we did the first row. Keely, penance, what does that word say to you? Yeah. Um, now, good, true. You, you know, most of you Catholics know that you go to the sacrament of penance, um, uh, or you do the penance after you go to the sacrament. Uh, you do something to remedy your sins. However, one of the myths I have to bust this chapter is this. Doing the actual penance does not forgive your sins. A lot of y'all think it does, but it doesn't. Um, 
the penance you're given is simply supposed to be a help or an atonement making up for your sins. When the priest raises his hand and says, I absolve you, that's when you're that's when you're forgiven of your sins. You could blow off your penance. That would be a sin, but you're still forgiven. So um, anything else to add to penance, Connor? Mm -hmm. In that that I don't want you to approach your penance that way. It's not like, okay, I went to confession, so now I have my homework. When I'm done my homework, I'm forgiven. No, you're forgiven, you know, by the by the words of the priest. Do you have anything for penance, Ryan? Okay, that that works. Uh, your penance is a consequence because you did these sins. You have this consequence. Um, you know, one time I confessed stealing a small object, and my penance was to try to pay that back uh, in whatever small way I could. You know. That is a consequence of my actions. Another word for that, use this as a branch off of your chart, is reparation. Your penance is supposed to be like a reparation. I hurt you, God. You forgave me in confession. Now I'm going to try to make it up to you in whatever small way I can. We almost never can truly make it up to him. But reparation, R-E-P-A-R. I don't know, it's a vocab word. I'm not very good. Asian, there you go. Or restitution is actually the vocab word, but it's a, another synonym of reparation. It's not that, but there's nothing in Latin. Whatever, you always say it's not that bad, and I miss like six. <laughs> well, we'll see what this chapter holds for you. All right, moving on to conversion, Danielle. Sacrament of conversion implies? Very good. Conversion it has two elements to it. There's a turning away from sin branch, but you have to turn to something, um, which is hopefully some sort of help for you as you all fight your sins. You know, you can't just say, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this anymore because you're going to do it. You gotta, you gotta turn. You gotta fill that void with something, you know. I remember uh, senior year football. I knew I was starting in the defensive backfield, but I had a small window to also be like the third wide receiver on the team. I made a couple, couple big catches early uh, in the, you know, the practice season, and so the coaches let me go both ways for a little bit. And then my hand just turned to rocks, and I just kept dropping passes. And I knew that I was losing. I was losing my time. I just got in mental funk. And I'll never forget, I, I, I was lined up wide receiver, and I said, here I go. And I did a little slant, and I said, don't drop it, don't drop it, don't drop it. And I dropped it. And it was right there. It was, it was like right at my waist. And I just, I was in a mental funk. And that was the last, I'll never forget it. it was that, that was the last play I ever had at wide receiver. If you focus on just don't do this, don't do this, like uh, I, this is bad, this is bad, you're going to do it. I think that's just psychology. You have to turn to something. You have to say, I'm going to turn to a more authentic love. I'm going to turn to God. I'm going to replace this sin with something virtuous. That's the sacrament of conversion. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, a turning away, of course, from bad to good. Do you have anything different? Returning to God. Uh, anything else, Macy? Teacher, please excuse the interruption. Rayleigh is currently having issues, so he has any problems, but he has no idea working to resolve all the problems. Thank you. Another thing you can branch off is just change. This is a sacrament more than almost any other sacrament. This sacrament in, impels, I don't know if that's the right word, implements the most amount of change in a, a person's life because. You have to be so real in confession with where you're at and where you need to be. You know, in Mass, you know, the Eucharist is a greater sacrament, but frankly, we all know we can hide and keep things to ourselves and not get real during Mass. There's no way dodging a real confession, um, you know, as long as you're doing the steps right. So that's conversion. Last one is forgiveness. Macy, what you got for forgiveness? What does forgiveness imply? Okay, there's a purity involved, like you kind of like wash clean. I like that. 
Is it Bell? Starting anew. Yeah. Okay, Ruth. Okay, there's a cleansing. Oh, uh, we got three different terms. All good, Anna Marie. Okay, so the, the implication with the sacrament is you're getting God's forgiveness. Josh, you got anything else? Well, that's a good one too. See, this is the biggest one because uh, y'all y'all look at these in light of the sacrament, but when it comes to forgiveness, y'all you, you, you have experience with that one, or you have a lack of experience with forgiveness, and you know you you know you kind of need some forgiveness. But there's a lot of different ways to come at what is forgiveness, and I think it's lar largely misunderstood amongst most people in the world. What does it mean to forgive? Um, yeah, restoring to love, finding a peace and a harmony. That, that's, those are all good and true. Um, how to go about it? Well, I'll go into more detail when we get to morality. But what I would say for forgiveness is, you know, letting go of a wrong, you know, to, to not hold somebody accountable for the wrong anymore, not punish them for the wrong anymore. So the implication here in the sacrament of forgiveness is, when you're forgiven of your sins, you bring you bring your junk to Jesus in the confessional. He through the priest he says, "I absolve you. You cannot, will not go to hell for those sins. You are forgiven. They're gone. Are there effects that hang around? Yeah. Are there addictions still lingering in your soul? Yeah. You got to work on those. But God will not deal with you based on those sins. Uh, largely, you wouldn't be punished for them should you die." It doesn't mean you go straight to heaven, unfortunately. Um, we'll talk about today another myth of confession. Is if you go to confession, you walk out of confession, you just get hit by a truck and you die, you go straight to heaven. Unfortunately, it's not true. Um, you won't go to hell if you confess everything on your heart. But um, there's, there's more work to be done to go straight to heaven, which you can do. All right. All right, good job there. Let's go to the Socrative part. I've been uh, very impressed uh, with the numbers so far today. Let's see if I'm still impressed. I am. <clears throat> Half of you are have attended confession in the past six months. That's pretty good. Uh, these numbers are a lot higher than when I started um, at Turlings. Um, Y'all are more comfortable, I guess, for whatever reason, you know, going to confession more and more. Uh, hopefully you trust our priests more and more. Father Doubt, by the way, will be here Wednesday for confessions. Um, and then, uh, so just over half of you are doing your Catholic duty, which is go every year, once a year. I really recommend going more than that. Um, you know, we just finished Advent, so maybe y'all had more opportunities for confession during Advent. Maybe that's why those numbers are high, but... Frankly, uh, Lent is going to be here before you know it in about a month, um, and uh, and so we got to you're going to have more opportunities then. Anyways, um, then there's that you know a couple of y'all that might have gone at like freshman retreat. There's like you know three or four of you that went back when you were in grade school, and maybe yeah, maybe five of you that. Haven't been since grade school. The good old days where, remember, you were lined up and you all had to go to confession. Um, I, I I don't know why they made you do that. I, I don't think this is a sacrament you can force on even a, an eighth grader. <laughs> but some of you haven't been back since then. Hopefully, hopefully I can give you some guidance on, on the value of, of this sacrament. One of the things I take most pride in, uh, one of the things that is most fulfilling to me as a teacher in this job is um, after this chapter, I always see longer lines of students ready to go to confession because some of y'all have been away for so long. And if I can offer anything to you to get you back there, it's that makes my job so worth it, regardless of whatever pay I get. Um, so good to see those numbers. Um, John chapter 20, uh, this is my favorite reference in the Bible to the sacrament of confession. Jesus greets his apostles by saying, what? Peace be with you. Um, he's here to offer peace, reconciliation. Of course, that's, that's the goal. 
This, of course, is one of the first appearances Jesus has to his apostles after he died and rose from the dead. And how did they recognize Jesus? Through his wounds. Very, yeah, and his side. He's, this is the real. This, this is me. This is the one who was crucified. And fun fact, if you learn nothing else today, this is how you say Jesus in sign language. I only know that because we're trying to teach our son sign language. And you just point to your to your palms. I, I didn't, foolish me, I didn't know why. And my wife's like, well, yeah, it's because that's, that's where, how you identify Jesus. You identify Jesus with the wounds. And so you just point to your palms and you're saying Jesus. So um, if you ever meet somebody that speaks sign language, you know one thing to say. You say, Jesus loves you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Work on that. Um, and how does he uh, bestow the spirit upon them? He breathes on them, which, yeah, he wouldn't do that today. He wouldn't. He'd be kicked out of campus. He'd be no breathing on anybody today. Um, but um, so the implication there, just so you know what Jesus is doing or the theological meaning, goes all the way back to Adam. God made Adam out of the dust, and then he breathed into him to make Adam like God. Well, Adam and Eve, we lost a lot of that. Jesus is breathing it back into us, through the apostles to us. He's breathing us back into a relationship with God, and that's what you get you know, in confession. Of course, these, these apostles are given the power to forgive sins. So a lot, lot of easy questions there, all of which are fair game for your easy test, which will be next week. And this is a short chapter. Um, I mean, we're easily pound out a less than a day. There's five lessons, but none of them will take two days to cover. There's no videos. There's no movies. I mean, there might be video. Oh, yeah, there will be Ed Puzzles next class. So bring some headphones for that. But um, it's pretty pretty cut to the point. Test next week. And then um, we'll still have, like, one more week of the second quarter. I might do anointing of the sick for, like, two days. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Or we might jump into morality. All right. So that's where we're at. Any questions, thoughts? Concerns. All right. This is that boring chapter you were so excited about. Remember. All right. Oh, I didn't go over your vocab. Uh, and there's a reason you're going to want to pay attention to this. Um, your vocab terms. Restitution. If you can pronounce it right, you can spell it right. Penance. Just remember it's E-A. A lot of students get that wrong. Uh, mixing up the, the first E and the first A. Penitence. Mortal sins. Purgatory. Act of contrition. Reconciliation. Venial sins, righteousness, also known as righteousness, excommunication, absolution, contrition. Pretty straightforward. The reason why I bring this up to you is to talk about the prayer for a minute. The prayer is the act of contrition. I want you to have an act of contrition memorized for next time you go to confession. Raise your hand if you have a version of the act of contrition memorized. You could go to confession today. About half of you. Um... Okay, which is great. You can probably just type out the version you have memorized. I don't feel the need. I don't want to teach you a new one. You only need one. Um, so you can type it out. You just got to make sure that your act of contrition meets all these criteria. For those of you that don't have one memorized, you're welcome. I found the shortest complete act of contrition on the Internet. And it goes like this. Oh, my God, I'm sorry for my sins because I offended you. I know I should love you above all things. Help me do penance to do better, to avoid anything that might lead me to sin. Amen. That's the condensed version. The version I learned, and I still say in confession, yeah, since the same, the, and I detest all my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, most of all because you, my God, who deserve all my love. I from the resolve with the help of thy grace to do penance to avoid the near occasion of sin. Amen. Oh, yeah. Okay, let me hear yours. Yours is weird. Ooh, you, you step off. <laughs> I 
Great, 20 out of 20. You hit all the bullet points. The version I was taught basically says, yes, God, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. But more importantly, I want to love you better. So the beginning part for mine is a little bit more loaded. A little bit more loaded and focused on, you know, your relationship with God. So this is how I'm going to grade it. There's like four criteria here, maybe five. If your version of the act of contrition meets all these four levels, you get 20 out of 20. So I'm very flexible with the wording. Very flexible. You just need to say, I'm sorry. I want to love you better. I want to do better. I'm going to do penance. Help me avoid things that take me away from you 20 out of 20. You got this, Ryan Richard? Good. Um, this is not going to be approved on your quiz, but the act of contr this is the shortest act of contrition. I used to go to Confession at Fatima on Johnson Street because I used to live near there. And uh, I go to confession, and uh, they have in the confessional, the act of contrition is this, Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You just say that, and the priest <laughs> absolves you. All you really need to do is to make an act of sorrow. It's an act of contrition. It's an act of sorrow over your sins. So as long as you say, God, I'm sorry for sinning, that's enough for the priest to give you absolution. Bobby, God. Yeah, something like that. Uh, I don't know if the priest will know what you're talking about, but God will, whether he takes that or not. Um, all right, so there's your vocab, which is Thursday. You know <clears throat> The... Um, the image on the board is of Jesus, of course. And it used to be the opening bell ringer of the chapter. And Jesus comes across a paralyzed man who's asking for healing. And Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven you. And I can't imagine what the paralyzed man was like. Okay, thanks. Sounds good. I'm still paralyzed. <laughs> and the Pharisees are just appalled that Jesus would say your sins are forgiven you. So, so Jesus senses the Pharisees in the background saying, "Can you? This man just said his sins are. Who could? Who could say your sins are forgiven?" Jesus turns around and says, "Listen, what what's easier to say? Paralyzed man, get up and walk, or your sins are forgiven." You. The Pharisees don't respond, but they're thinking, "Well, it's a lot easier to say your sins are forgiven you, than get up and walk, because you know who has that power." And then Jesus says, "I right, paralyzed man." get up and walk. And the man walks away. So Jesus is saying, I have the power to forgive sins. I am, I'm above everybody else that you've ever seen. Um, as he, and he, and he used the healing of the body to show the healing of the soul, which is primary. We might get to that when, a little bit more when we get to anointing of the sick, but Jesus, of course, has this power to forgive our sins. And as you read in your bell ringer today, he passes that on to his apostles. Now, one quick slide before we go into confession on the uh, sacraments of healing. Because you see up here, these are all, all seven sacraments and they have their categories. For those of you watching virtually, uh, this is all on my dry erase board. Um, but our three sacraments of initiation, we did one of, the, one of the sacraments of vocation or service, which is matrimony. And now we're in another category, sacraments of healing, um, namely confession. And um, to, to remind you that you've already been taught about baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, and the mass amounts of grace that we get from those is great. But often it's not enough. The sad story is as, as, as great as those sacraments are, they're not enough. St. Paul says the following, We have this treasure, this grace from God, in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God Maybe of the power of God and not from ourselves. And you see down here pictured these uh, these large jugs made, you know, of mud and clay, you know, old school pottery. And they're very breakable, basically, you know. Um, and St. Paul says, we got, we got so many graces from God, but we lose them. And uh, frankly, other than the 
character that you get from baptism and confirmation, you can lose all your other graces. And we do. We do lose the graces whenever we sin, especially when we commit mortal sin, which we'll talk about in the next class. Through the sacraments of Christian initiation, man receives new life in Christ. Now we carry this life in earth in vessels, in crackpots. You know, that's that's the joke that comes with this uh, Bible passage. We're all a bunch of crackpots. Um, we're filled with God, but then we crack ourselves with sin and we lose the graces. That being said, this new life as a child of God can be weakened or even lost by sin. Because of that, you know, we have the sacraments of healing. That's, that's why we need the sacraments of healing. We need the sacraments of healing because we often lose the graces that we're already given. And so we got to go back to patch it up. So can, if, we're, if we're a car, you know, confession, anointing of the sick, that's your, uh, that's your car wash, that's your oil change, maybe a new set of tires, you know. It's your, it's your maintenance. It's trying to keep you on the road to heaven. The bird, the, the bird poop. That's when you do something stupid in front of other people and it's just glaring and there's a social stigma on that. And then you go through the car wash and I don't know. Sometimes it doesn't come off in the car wash, frankly. But I don't want to. You're, you're taking the analogy a little bit too far there. So it's a sin. We're talking about maintaining a car, and you know, confession is your car wash. And Ryan's like, What's a burp? I'm like, That would be a pretty bad sin that everyone can see that you really want to get off. Yeah, it's all right. Not everyone pays as good attention as you do, Ryan. This. My friends, is the question of the day. Uh, this is the number one question students have about the sacrament of confession. It's not that you don't like it. It's not that you hate it. But frankly, why? Why, Mr. Pale? Why, Catholic Church, do we have to say our sins to a priest? It's really awkward. Uh, I'm going to give you three reasons. And if I'm giving you three reasons, what does that tell you? It's going to be a discussion question. Discussion question? Sure. Oh, and it's going to be on your test, which is what most of y'all were thinking. If we could close our Chromebooks that are left open. Thank you. So I'm going to give you three reasons why we have to say our sins out loud to a priest. The first one is the most simple and theological. Namely that, because Jesus said so. Let me find my clicker. Uh, Jesus gave his apostles this power, which you got in your bell ringer today. And in them receiving this power, the message to us is, Jesus says, if you want to be reconciled with God, go talk to these guys, and they'll hook you up. They can forgive your sins. They can also choose to not forgive your sins. We'll talk about that, maybe less than three or four about how or why a priest might not grant you forgiveness. Um, here's the cool thing about it. That if you go to a priest, um, you know, some students will say, a lot of people think, well, I can just tell God I'm sorry on my own time in the silence of my heart. Might even just say it out loud to God. And doesn't Jesus want to forgive that? Yeah, he does. He wants to. But the problem is, not that Jesus doesn't want to forgive it, but the problem is our prayer for forgiveness is oftentimes a little too impure, frankly. Because we all know we kind of enjoy our sins. A lot of us, we feel bad about them, we'll confess them, but we really expect to do them again. Um, and so we're torn, you know. And so when we'd say, God, hey, God, can you forgive me? I don't want to go to hell. Um, it's, that's a hard prayer for Jesus and God 
It's not that they don't want to, but it's frankly that prayer is so mixed and impure that it may not be heard. The cool thing about going to a priest, as I have here on the board, is that you're given a guarantee. Namely that I gave my sorrow, my partial, imperfect sorrow, my contrition to the priest, and he said I was forgiven. And by the power that he has, it overrode, basically, my impure contrition. And now I'm forgiven. Now I'm good with God again. So it's the power of the priest can give you a stronger guarantee that your sins are forgiven. I don't know about you, but I want that guarantee. So that if I die, I can say, God, I brought that all to your priest. You know, I said that out loud and it was, I was given the words of your minister that I was forgiven. I don't want to be able to say, oh, I talked to you in private about that because, um, you know, my, my prayer might not have been pure enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's reason number one. It's, it's a theological reason. Number two is a psychological reason for telling your sins to a priest. It allows you to look honestly at your sins and be accountable for them, allowing for a greater conversion. It creates a greater uh, sense of uh, responsibility. That's kind of the key word uh, below for for this part. It helps you own up to it. I remember uh, being a maybe a middle school boy, and. Uh, my parents would bring us to confession the first Saturday of every month. Every uh, Saturday afternoon, we got in the car and we were brought to confession. And I never, I didn't have a problem going. I knew of its value and importance, but I wasn't very good at it. I would say, uh, Father, I, I confess, um, you know, allowing myself to be distracted in Mass. And I confess a couple of doing. A um, couple times, and uh, I confess hitting my scissors and fighting with them. And uh, I remember the priest being completely confused, which is completely my point of why I mumbled so much. I didn't want to. I didn't want to actually say it. You know, I didn't want to admit that I did that, uh, or you know, and uh, it, it would have been so good for me. And I did get to a point in high school. When I, I, I remember, I, I knew I needed to go to confession. I found a priest, and it, I had to go face-to-face, -face and it went great. And um, because I, I had this, I, found that I felt the absolute need to say my sin out loud, the priest was able to help me so much better. Uh, he really let me, allowed me to feel forgiven, uh, not to put a lot of shame and judgment upon myself. It was so healing. And I got a lot of strength from that. In other words, when you can say it out loud, it helps you own up, gets you the responsibility. It's going to help you move past it a little bit more. You know, um, Father Blake Dubrock in, in Bro Bridge gave a homily yesterday that I heard, and it was it was really good. He talked about how, you know, yesterday we celebrated the Epiphany of the Magi or following the star. He talked about how you got to, to see a star, you have to be in darkness, or you have to go out into the darkness to see the star, to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And he, and he connected that psychologically. He said that uh, people who have undergone sexual trauma um, were partakers in a study, and they were trying to figure out what really allows them to heal. And 
what was discovered is that the number one factor in a person's ability to heal from trauma or abuse is this. You have to be able to talk about it. You have to say it out loud. You have to process it all the way through with somebody. If you can do that, you're going to find some healing. That was like the number one factor. And that's the wisdom of the church when she says, go to a priest to talk about your crap. Because when you bring your crap to the priest, um, then you're, you're just allowing for more light to come in. You know? And it just it, psychologically it helps you move past it. So that, that's my experience. Hopefully it's yours. Um, okay. Thoughts, questions? The third one is very similar, but it's more spiritual than psychological. An open confession that you're saying with your own mouth uh, strips the devil of his power uh, to use our sins against us. Sin separates us from God, and silent prayer is therefore uh, can be less effective. The power given by the priest brings light uh, to weaken the devil. This especially goes for mortal sins. Um, you know, when we commit a mortal sin, we are really exposing ourselves to demonic influence. And so I'm going to give you a, an exorcism story here. To help illustrate the power of confession. True story. This happens regularly with, with uh, exorcisms. <clears throat> if you want to get a demon out and the demon's not leaving, there could be a couple of reasons for that. I'm going to give you one of them. But to weaken the, de the demon, there's two things you can get. You can ask the demon for its name. And then when you get the demon's name, you have more authority over it. The second thing you can ask the demon to give you is what sin brought you here? What sin did this person commit that allowed you to possess their soul? And one such story, in the name of Jesus Christ, demon, tell me what sin brought you here? The demon, I wasn't present for this one, but it was, I met the person that was possessed, I think, and, um, and the, the demon responded, Unforgiveness. It was the intentional grudge that this person was holding against somebody else in their life that was a sin. And because of it, the demon didn't have to leave. The demon would not listen to the exorcist saying, leave, leave, leave. The demon's like, I'm good here. She, this person possessed, has not confessed it. Like, she's let me stay. She hasn't said she's sorry for it. She hasn't forgiven, so I'm good. And that's that's the one one of the reasons why an exorcism may not work. So this is what happens. A person comes back to their senses, and the, the exorcist says, Okay, uh, my dear child, um, is there anybody in your life that you haven't forgiven? Because we believe a lot of this demonic activity is happening because of this, this, this. The person says it, admits it, makes an act of forgiveness to the person, and then a week or so later goes back to get another round of exorcisms and poof, demon's gone. Point of that story is this. Number one, a confession is more powerful than an exorcism. You can go through an exorcism and the demon can say, I have a right to this person's soul. You go to confession and, and the demons like take their claws off of your soul. Because you, you brought the light into the darkness of your soul and they got to go. So the power of confession, number one, but number two is the power of saying your sins out loud um, is what uh, allow, allows 
your temptations to, they'll still be there, but they won't be as strong, perhaps. Um, you'll have more strength to fight your temptations when you continually say them to Jesus out loud. And I know it's hard, and it's annoying going to confession for the same sins over and over again. I know. I don't confess the same sins that I did in high school, but I, I confess the same sins over and over. It's a long battle, but each time, you know, you get more and more strength. And with the help of God, you will move past them, I assure you. So um, that's my story to illustrate that uh, why, why say our sins to the priest? Why not in the quiet of your room? Well, in the quiet of your room, there, there's not necessarily the power and the grace to, to knock out the demons in our lives. All right. Thoughts or questions on that sacrament? Y'all look pretty quiet today, slash hungover from lunch, slash break. So we'll call it there. Um, and uh, pick it up next class.